So today uh, we have our first talk of the uh, of the fall season, and uh, I'm excited to announce um, our speakers today. We have Drs. Jessica Allen and James Lendemer, uh, who are co-authors on a new book coming out called Urban Lichens, uh, a field guide for Northeastern North America. And so they're going to be talking to us about uh, about a lot of things, I'm imagining, but most, most of it probably ties back to this book. And uh, I'm certainly excited to hear from them. Um, so hold on a minute. More people are coming in. We're getting lots of people. This is great. <laughs> uh, and once again, I just want to reiterate that we're going to keep our, our um, we're going to keep our mics and cameras off for our lecture today, aside from uh, the speakers. So uh, whenever you guys are ready, you are free to start. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordan, for the introduction. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here today and um, to have a chance to share some of our work with you all. You know, I know um, James and I are both really grateful to the Tory, Botan Botan Tory Botanical Society. Uh, they, the society supported quite a bit of this research along with the publication of our book, which we'll talk about a bit at the end of this session. And indeed, as Jordan mentioned, we are talking about lichens, people, and the urban experience. Um, and before we dive in any further, uh, and it's also worth noting that uh, Jordan was a major part of this book as well. And um, many of the pictures that we use throughout this presentation were, uh, especially of lichens, were taken by Jordan. <clears throat> so the development and growth of dense urban areas has dominated shifts in human movement patterns and substantially altered landscapes on all continents over the past two centuries. You know, as of 2018, 55% of the human population lived in an urban conglomerate. Uh, and those urban areas cover roughly 3% of the Earth's land area. Uh, there's a projection of continued uh, increase in urbanization globally. Um, and so by 2030, that land area covered by urban areas is predicted to have tripled um, to encompass an additional 1.5 million square kilometers. Population growth in urban areas is also predicted to continue. Uh, and the current estimates are that about 60% of the human population will occupy these urban conglomerates by 2030. Um, and about one in three people will live in cities with over 500,000 people. And large urban areas are also predicted specifically to increase. So uh, the number of urban centers with over 1 million people um, is predicted to increase from the 548 recorded in 2018 to 706 by 2030. And mega cities, so those are cities with over 10 million people, um, are projected to increase from 33 in 2018 to 43 by 2030. The rapid rise in urbanization globally leads to multiple intersectional and interdisciplinary questions on human innovation and ingenuity, disparities in resource and wealth distribution, politics, history, the arts, and biodiversity sciences. Indeed, urban systems rest at the nexus of contemporary, contemporary human civilization. Now, landscapes um, in urban areas tend to be very complex. And when we compare them to adjacent natural areas, they are often hotter and drier, composed of many novel and diverse materials. Uh, they tend to be subjected to a much higher disturbance frequency than those adjoining natural areas. And all of these conditions together uh, create a stressful environment, sometimes for people, often for people, um, and also for biodiversity. Nonetheless, we do see a rich variety of biodiversity occupying the habitats and microclimates in the cities. So we have lovely examples like red-tailed hawks, barred owls, snowy owls, and coyotes. Um, there's some pretty incredibly diverse plant communities. So um, Atha, Daniel Atha and his colleagues reported for over four, 438 plant species that spontaneously occurred in Central Park recently. Um, 
and there have been over 2,000 plant species reported citywide in New York, roughly 70% of which are native. We study urban biodiversity to learn what non-human species occupy the city and how they might thrive in the built environment. And in doing so, we simultaneously gain a lens on ourselves, our culture, and our day-to-day -day environment. Among all of the groups of biodiversity we might study in an urban setting, lichens have a really unique story to tell and one that provides us with essential information about ourselves and our society. So lichens are fungi that enter into symbioses with algae and cyanobacteria, photosynthesizing organisms, for the purposes of obtaining nutrition. Lichens are unique fungal lifestyle, and the symbioses that they form are both complex and, in my opinion, as well as I hope everyone else here, utterly beautiful. Uh, anyone that's seen a carpet of sort of fungal mycelium or a smudge of green algae on a wet tree or rock uh, has to agree that the form that the lichens take is just truly astonishingly different from any one of the constituent members that make it up uh, were they to grow on their own. So if you were to cut into a lichen like this one, a sea storm lichen from the Southern Appalachian Mountains where I happen to be sitting right now, uh, you'd see layers of fungal tissue and those encase a layer where the fungal tissue is intermixed with its algal partner. So lichens are fungi that are alluring and also unique, uh, but they're also incredibly important. So they form intimate and dynamic communities where many distantly related species grow together in close proximity, like for example, this branch in an old growth forest in the Great Smoky Mountains. They employ a strategy wherein the species rely on each other for their collective survival, sharing members of their microbial communities and bolstering moist microhabitats that foster the growth of more and more lichens. We like to say, or Jesse has coined the term, that uh, lichens beget lichens. Uh, but lichens aren't just important to each other. They also play key roles in the lives of many plants and animals. So for instance, there's this lacewing larva that was photographed by Jordan uh, on the New York Botanical Garden grounds. Uh, and it uses a covering of lichens on its back uh, as camouflage. Lichens also perform essential ecosystem functions. So for instance, this like they contribute significantly to the nitrogen cycle. And this lichen has fallen from a tree in the forest down onto the ground, and it'll contribute its fixed nitrogen uh, as its body begins to decompose. So lichens are such amazing and important fungi that you'd probably think they're impervious to just about everything. Yet, of course, the complete opposite is true. It's a paradox of the lichen lifestyle that such highly specialized and adapted organisms are incredibly sensitive to disturbance and pollution. And that's why regardless of where you go in our local area and even many places worldwide, lichens have declined substantially in diversity and abundance from what they would have originally been centuries ago. That's true in natural habitats on Long Island, large urban green spaces like Central Park and heavily industrialized areas like the Meadowlands of New Jersey. And the study region that James and I will be talking about today and delving into the lichens of is the Northeast Megalopolis. Um, this region that spans from Boston to Washington, DC. And this term for the area was first coined by Gene Gottman in 1957. This region is home to 50 million people, which comprises about 17% of the United States population and occupies about 2% of the nation's land area. It's a fabulous place to study urban biodiversity, uh, not only because it is our uh, sort of largest urban area in the United States, especially as far as population goes, um, but also because it has such a strong and multi-century baseline of biodi biodiversity data from scientific publications and natural history specimens. Of course, James and I focus very heavily on the heart of this region, New York City. So New York City is a lot of things to a lot of people. It's indisputably a dynamic place with an amazing diversity of people, cultures, and experiences. The landscape itself is diverse, a network of green spaces and areas developed for a huge variety of human uses. The long history of dynamic and diverse human occupation of the city, though, coincides with a remarkable degree of documentation of the natural world. We know that New York City was once home to lichen communities that were as dynamic and diverse as the present day human inhabitants. Those communities included species like those pictured here. We know that this was, that this was the case, because, um, we know that this was the case because the lichens of New York City have been documented by naturalists for hundreds of years. 
uh, through their writings and specimens preserved in natural history collections. We can understand just exactly how things have changed over the, over the time that the city has existed and continued to grow. Take, for instance, this lungwort lichen, uh, Loberia pulmonaria. It's a disturbance sensitive and pollution intolerant lichen, uh, and it was reported from New York City in the early 1800s. Jesse's going to talk about that more in a minute. These specimens document that it grew on in Southampton on Long Island in 1898, and it even grew in the Palisades of New Jersey just across the Hudson River from New York City in the 1860s. Yet this species has appears to have completely disappeared from the region. It hasn't been found since 1914 uh, by any subsequent researchers, including ourselves. The first attempt at fully documenting the lichen species that occur in New York um, was taken on by John Torrey, the namesake of the Torrey Botanical Society. He included a short list of lichens at the end of his catalog of the plants growing spontaneously in New York. Um, and this was really a preliminary list, right? So he, again, it was right at the end and kind of appended there. Um, and he does even mention in the uh, text of this document that um, he didn't feel satisfied with all of the identifications. He didn't feel like he'd captured all of the diversity and he was waiting until um, the species are satisfactorily asked satisfactorily ascertained, right, until we know the full number. But he did end up including 61 species uh, in that publication. Shortly thereafter, Abraham Halsey, a banker in Manhattan, um, and a colleague and a corresponder with Tory, took on the task of putting together a much more complete list of species. Um, he ended up reporting 191 species from the region, um, and again, this likely isn't this likely doesn't include every single species that occurred in New York, but it gets us a lot closer. Um, and here, it's worth restating um, one of Abraham Halsey's sentiments um, that he included in this document uh, that I would say that I st heartily still agree with today. Notwithstanding the great progress which the science of botany has made in this country, the cryptogamic branch of it still suffers under the most unmerited neglect. Indeed. <clears throat> now, the natural history collections that underlie the research uh, done by Tory and Halsey, unfortunately, were lost um, either in move, moves made by the Lyceum or when the building um, caught fire in 1866. So, you know, unfortunately we can't go back and look at those actual specimens. However, you know, we can infer that, you know, with the taxonomic changes, we can sort of infer what they were seeing. Um, and we have a pretty good idea of what those species were. Now, about a hundred years after that, the next attempt at putting together um, a checklist for the species was undertaken by Charles Wood, who was a graduate student at the New York Botanical Garden. Um, and he and he ended up reporting 51 species. And you will notice that he actually um, increased the radius around um, City Hall in which he searched for lichens to 100 miles. So Halsey and Tory looked at a much smaller radius. Um, I suspect that he had to do that because there was such a decline in the diversity. Uh, and he also noted that the meager and scattered data concerning lichens in this re region made it um, a bit challenging and also it sort of made a bid for increased biodiversity documentation uh, throughout the area. And I, again, this is a sentiment that I think still exists today. Okay, we'll make another long leap uh, through history to 1968. And the next major researcher that we need to discuss is Irwin or Ernie Brodo. So if you're familiar with the lichens of North America, that beautiful, really comprehensive book about lichens, Ernie is the first author on that. Um, and he's actually from New York City. Uh, he's from the Bronx. Uh, he, uh, he earned his bachelor's degree from City College, um, his, his master's degree from Cornell and then went on to study the lichens on Long Island for his dissertation research. He graciously sent us a few pictures from his field work um, in, that he conducted in the 1960s. Um, in the top left, you see 
a picture of him performing a folk music concert at Stony Brook National Lab, and then the bottom left sailing across the sound to one of his field sites. Now, Ernie did an incredible, like an incredible amount of work uh, when he documented the flora of Long Island. Um, every dot on this map shows a site that he visited where he um, collected voucher specimens of every species that lived there, recorded their abundance, did a really lovely community and floristic analysis um, of the entire island. And you will, you can see there that three of his sites uh, fell within King and Queens County. So he has those three sites that are in the city. And he, at that time, he reported eight species in total um, from, from those three sites. Now, when I was a graduate student at uh, the New York Botanical Garden, the City University of New York, uh, we came upon the uh, centennial, the need for the like centennial update to the lichen uh, checklist for New York City. So I took that on. Um, and this was a kind of a multi-year project that really started with being engaged with the Macaulay Honors College bio blitzes that are run by Kelly O'Donnell and Lisa Brundage. Um, where you know we go out with undergraduates from Macaulay and collect and identify lichens from some pretty iconic parks throughout the city, starting with Central Park, also including Fresh Kills Park. So I collected throughout New York. Um, I also um, took a look at the herbarium specimens held at the New York Botanical Garden, reviewed some recent, more recent literature, um, and ultimately put together um, a checklist that included 106 species, right? So, uh, and I set the start date for including species on this checklist as 1968, because we saw that such a clear decline um, in the lichen diversity and a um, kind of, I think about that as the point from which the lichen community of New York started to rebuild. And this Research is published in the Tory Botanical Society um, memoirs, in the memoirs of the society in their sesquicentennial celebration issue. It's always nice to be able to use that word. Okay, so if we take all of this together, um, we, and, you know, keeping in mind that John Tory's list in 1819 was not complete, um, we see a very clear pattern here of a decline and a recent re, some recent recolonization events. Now that initial decline in the 1800s is likely mostly due to the conversion of the landscape from natural systems to a built environment. The decline throughout uh, the 20th century, uh, that continued decline is likely due in a large part uh, to air quality issues. So lichens are extremely sensitive to air pollution, the same air pollutants that negatively impact human health. And we have a, a bit of background information on the air quality in New York. So um, the first, they first started, they first started monitoring air quality in 19, the 1920s. And at that time they found that the particular, there was, the particulate matter in the air occluded about 50% of the sunlight when you were standing at ground level. Um, and then it only got worse. So by the 1950s, 1960s, there were multiple uh, smog events that caused dozens of acute fatalities. Um, but now, you know, we're seeing these lichens come back and there, I think there are two main reasons for that. Right, so the first is that we've had a relatively stable built environment um, for quite a while now. And then the second is that the air quality has improved drastically, um, especially since the advent of the Clean Air Act in the 1970s and subsequent city and state specific regulations um, that have really improved the health and safety for people in the city and clearly for lichens. And based on that sort of floristic data, we, we can see that pattern of a decline in recolonization. And another way that we can look at this and have an even, even stronger um, sort of scientific uh, lens on this recovery is to go back and re, um, reassess the, bio, the diversity at sites that were previously um, studied. So one thing that I did when I was putting together that checklist was to 
to resample the lichens at two of Ernie Brodo's sites, so Alley Pond Park and Brooklyn Botanic Garden. Uh, his numbers for those sites are shown in, gray, shown in gray here, and the number of species that I found are shown in green. We see a clear increase. And then James more recently went back to uh, revisit the high line, um, and he also recovered the same pattern over a shorter time period, so between 2004 and 2019 we again see an increase in the number of species. So there's a, this clear um, pattern of recolonization. Now, there actually, there's quite a bit more to this story and I'll pass it, on to J pass it off to James here to tell you a bit of the nuance behind the scenes of, of what might be happening. So as Jesse said, there's now over a hundred species that we know are living within New York City today. Um, and so we see multi-species lichen communities almost everywhere that you look in the city. And it's the same in other north northeastern cities throughout the U.S. You know, rocks in Central Park, dunes in Floyd Bennett Field in Brooklyn, even the revegetated landfill at Fresh Kills on Staten Island. Um, there's these multi-species communities where you see lichens of different, different types growing in close proximity together. And what's really important to remember, though, is that these communities have arisen through diverse processes. And so two individuals that are growing side by side may not necessarily have gotten there in the same way. Um, and different species have different stories. So if we look at the lichen flora of New York City over the centuries, it's possible to see that all of the species generally follow one of three main themes. So the first are the ones that we've lost. Those are presumably lost due to habitat change uh, and air pollution, uh, but they haven't returned. Then there's the ones that survived through the darkest days of air pollution uh, into the present day. And then finally, they're the ones that were pushed out of the city, presumably again due to habitat loss and air pollution, uh, but have managed to return uh, as the conditions have improved. And so I'm going to take a few minutes now and tell some of the stories of these individual species that sort of exemplify these different three different themes. So the species that have been lost from New York City uh, and not returned mostly fall into one of several groups. The first of these are large, three-dimensional fruticos lichens that are highly sensitive to air pollution. Uh, Usnea strigosa is one of these species that once occurred commonly throughout much of temperate eastern North America. You can still find it in the Pine Barrens, in New Jersey, and on Long Island. Uh, and here's a photograph of it in all its beautiful glory uh, on the Del Delmarva Peninsula of Maryland. Um, this species was presumably once abundant in New York City. It was reported by both Tory and Halsey, although we can't know the precise locations of their reports uh, because the collections were lost, unfortunately. But we know that it was still living in the city, and uh, judging by the looks of this specimen here, it was thriving uh, during the 1860s in Ridgewood, Queens. Uh, unfortunately, after the 1860s, there's just no subsequent reports or specimens. It wasn't found by Ernie Brodo, it wasn't found by Wood, and it wasn't found by us. So it appears to be a species that's gone. Sad face emoji. Another group of lichens that uh, have suffered the same fate are those that associate with cyanobacteria, commonly known as jelly lichens. So the last of these species was reported from New York City by Wood in 1914. He reported a single species, uh, and we haven't found any of them during our present work. So the case of cyanolichens is really exemplified by this species, Kalima subflacidum, uh, which is still widespread in parts of temperate eastern North America. Thanks to this museum specimen, we know that it was growing on Snake Hill in New Jersey in 1860. For those of you who are not in the know, Snake Hill is located in the Meadowlands of New Jersey, uh, and it was formerly the site of one of the largest asylums in the state of New Jersey. Uh, the S Snake Hill, the rock that formed the hill, was subsequently quarried away and uh, is now located directly adjacent to the New Jersey Turnpike and the Secaucus Transit Terminal. Uh, you can see the remnants of the hill here on the lower left corner of this map. Interestingly, there are still trees and rocks on Snake Hill, or at least what remains of it. But you can see just how much the lichens have changed, and it's hard to imagine a species like Kalima being able to survive here now. <clears throat> 
Moving on to the cohort of sort of gritty survivors, uh, we have Clodonia cespiticia. This is another species that's common in eastern North America where it grows on soil and on the bases of trees. Uh, and it was reported by both Tory and Halsey. So we can be reasonably certain it was present in the city very early on, even though none of their specimens survive today. Wood found it in Jamaica, Queens in uh, 1914. And during the height of the air pollution, Ernie Brito found it throughout Long Island, including at a site in Queens. We've even found it in Central Park today. So here's one of Jordan's photographs from 2019. This is one of the few species that appears to have stuck with us the entire time. You might notice that these two pictures look a little different though. Yeah, this is what we would call a really great example of a city morph. So um, while a lot of these species will occur in New York uh, and in more pristine habitats, they might and often do look quite different in the city, potentially a little bit more scraggly. You can see this one doesn't have any of its reproductive structures, um, but it's still hanging on there. Uh, and one thing I will note is that uh, when it comes to uh, time to talk about our book, I will say that we we man we really focused on getting that documenting that city morph so that we can actually you could actually use it uh, to compare to what you're seeing when you're in an urban setting. So one of the lichens that we see now in commonly see around us in northeastern U.S. cities, uh, you know, uh, sorry, the lichens that we see around us commonly in, in northeastern U.S. cities, by far the majority of those seem to have returned after having been previously extirpated from pollution and disturbance, things like that. Uh, and a great example of this group uh, in New York City and in other northeastern cities is Flavoparmelia caparata. So this is without a doubt one of the most common species in our region. And if you're driving down a road at 40 miles an hour and you see a green lichen on a tree, it's this one. So you should all learn it. <laughs> Flavoparmelia caparata. So here you can see it again in its full splendor on the Delmarva Peninsula of Maryland. Um, this species was reported by Tory and Halsey in the early 1800s. And we actually have specimens from the 1860s that were collected at three different locations in Queens. Um, I think that gives you a sense of just how common it probably was at that time, because for most of the other species, uh, we only have one historical collection at that, from the 1860s around that time. We actually have three of these. So that I think says a lot, uh, but it wasn't found by Wood in 1914. It wasn't reported by Ernie in the 1960s. So there seems to be pretty strong evidence that the species was extirpated from the city at that time. Uh, interestingly, though, during our own field work throughout the city, we found it in, in every borough, and it appears to be relatively common in large green spaces. Uh, so here's a picture of, uh, of it taken by Jordan at the New York Botanical Garden in 2019. And you can see, I don't think it looks half bad compared to the photograph from Maryland. So Flavoparmelia caparata, it's returned, and it seems to be doing all right, at least in some of the places where it grows. And this is another opportunity for us to revisit some some of Ernie Brodo's research. Um, and in, in the 1960s, he took specimens of the species from farther out on Long Island, moved them into the city, actually transplanted them into the city, and all of the individuals were dead or dying within four months. So I'd say this is some pretty strong evidence to support our hypothesis that Flavoparmelia caparata was likely completely extirpated from New York and has since recolonized. Now, we definitely don't want to leave you with the impression that sensitive species will never return. Uh, and so we should briefly mention Usnin utabilis. So you can see this beautiful species in many parts of the Eastern US, including in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey. Uh, but like Usnia stragosa, it was lost from New York City and it wasn't relocated by us uh, when we've gone throughout the city, uh, when we were in the process of writing this book. Um, but interestingly, a single individual was found in Woodlawn Cemetery during a Tory Botanical Society field trip in 2018. And it was only two years later that another was found in Greenwood Cemetery by enterprising urban naturalists from Brooklyn. Uh, the individuals were so tiny that they could only be identified with certainty using DNA sequencing, but it just goes to show you that there is hope uh, that these lichens are returning and will return if the conditions continue to improve and habitats are left unmanaged and wild, at least to some degree, as much as they can be in a city. Now, we do see that some of these 
species are recolonizing New York City. However, that the community that has returned likely doesn't look exactly like it did initially. So based on observing communities in natural areas in, throughout the Northeast outside of urban areas, it's clear that the species that are most abundant um, in those natural areas do not mirror their sort of urban cousins, one could say. Um, so for instance, in New York City, the, some of our most abundant species are these three, Candelaria concolor, Fissia milligrana, and Flavo primelia caparata, which are not necessarily as prolific elsewhere. And so we bring these three species up to sort of just briefly mention there's some pretty, there have likely been some fairly drastic shifts in abundance, um, but also to give, for those of you who tuned in to learn a few species that might grow on the street trees outside of your house, um, these three would be fabulous ones to know. So um, they're all very distinctive and very common. Yellow, green, and gray. <laughs> yes, and one of each color, perfect. <laughs> uh, so we've been focused on lichens recolonizing the city, doing it for themselves, as one could say. Uh, but there's also a steady flow of lichens that are brought into the city by humans. And uh, either knowingly for decoration, like these luxuriant lichens on branches that were put into a planter near Union Square in Manhattan, uh, or unknowingly, because they're attached to a substrate that's brought into the city for another use. So for instance, these large rocks were brought into Manhattan for a sculptural installation on the Hudson Piers. Um, the rocks were covered with lichens, including Prado-Parmeliopsis uh, muralis, a species that has never been known to occur in New York City. Uh, so you're probably wondering, much as we were, you know, what happens to all of these lichens that are sort of brought in knowingly or unknowingly by people? Well, the answer appears to be the vast majority of them don't actually survive. While air pollution and unsuitable environmental conditions may have killed Ernie Brodo's transplants, uh, it seems likely that most lichens are just not well adapted to being moved around and into the stressful conditions of the city from afar away. Um, so studying how lichens respond to this kind of movement uh, and how they are brought, what happens to them once they're brought into cities is something that really anyone can do with a phone and iNaturals. Uh, and so for instance, I noticed this uh, lichens here growing on an ornamental maple tree that was planted in front of a new apartment building on 22nd Street in 2015. Uh, and it had lots of lichens on it when it arrived and was planted. Uh, you can see there's several different species there. By the end of 2015, the lichens were definitely looking a little worse for wear. They were looking for pretty ragged. And by 2020, the lichens were completely gone. You can see there's a few shadows of the lichens that once were. The tree itself hasn't really changed all that much. It hasn't grown that much. Uh, what's changed is the presence of the lichens. And James and I uh, also conducted an experiment to see if we could uh, rather than incidentally move lichens into New York, actually purposefully remove some lichens back in. So assisted recolonization, like actually conduct an assisted recolonization for a couple of species. So one of those species was the common reindeer lichen, Cladonia subpenuous, which is lovely. And uh, it does occur in air naturally in some areas nearby. So um, here is an example of a population at Liberty State Park in New Jersey. Um, this photograph was taken by Natalie Howe and you can see how um, these populations occupy a somewhat forested landscape. So in 2015, James and I traveled down to the Pine Barrens and collected a number of individuals of this species and brought them back to the New York Botanical Garden. And we tried to find some really suitable homes, little some protected places to place these um, individuals. And uh, what ended up happening is that shortly after putting them into place, they ended up either disappearing or dying for the most part, um, really within a, within a year, six months to a year. At that same time, uh, we also transplanted multiple individuals of Usnea mutabilis, again, from the Pine Barrens to the New York Botanical Garden. Um, here they are. We use silicon sealant to attach them to some trees in the same family forest. Um, and short, about six months later, we went back to look at them and we saw that they were not particularly healthy. And again, within a year or two, they were all dead or gone. Um, and so this really 
this was a bit of a letdown for us. Um, and it really highlights how lichens kind of, how that recolonization of this urban area seems to need to go. Essentially lichens have to move back in by themselves. Um, and so if we're considering, um, you know, the question of like, how do we support as much lichen biodiversity as possible in the city, um, moving them back purposefully does not seem to be the best uh, way to do so. Instead, we really have to build habitats um, and consider, con consider regulations to continue cleaning up our air quality and really making the space for the lichens to occur. And I would also say that um, leaving wilder spaces or unmanaged places in the city is key to that. And James has a great example um, of how that might look. So the that lichens have come back into the city on their own is really, really well illustrated, I think, by the High Line. Uh, in some ways, it's sort of the last place I think most people would expect lichens to have recolonized. I mean, an elevated train line in like midtown and downtown Manhattan just seems crazy to me. Uh, and there were almost no lichens there when Richard Stalter studied it in the early 2000s. Uh, he only reported a few species. But then uh, he asked me to come visit in 2019 to study the last remnant area of the High Line that remained wild. Uh, and it hadn't been converted into the present day modernized park that's visited by many people and beloved by all. Uh, although there were no lichens in the extensive modernized areas that are encompass the entire rest of the park, there's almost a dozen species that have managed to recolonize just this one little area that takes up half the width of the train line and goes on for maybe about a block. Um, so almost a dozen species have managed to colonize that small area that remains. And just to me, that's amazing. I mean, this includes a whole plethora of different species with many different growth forms, many different shapes and colors. It's not just one thing that's managed to make it back. Um, and they're doing fine, despite the fact that like hundreds and thousands of people walk on the modernized path that's just a few feet away from them. So protecting these urban green spaces and allowing some to remain unmanaged and you know wild as Jesse said is really essential for the lichens to survive in our cities and it's it's really important because the loss of lichens that have managed to adapt to these novel environments is tragic because it means that we're losing the very individuals that may be best prepared to survive the future conditions of our city and our planet If you're interested in learning more about lichens, or if this talk has piqued your interest, um, and you want to be able to identify the lichens that occur around you, we luckily have a resource to help you out with that. Um, so we have a book coming out with Yale University Press in November um, that, you know, I really, and I initiated writing this book while I was putting that species list together. And after being asked so many times for of uh, some sort of something to help people learn more about lichens. And I know that James and I know that Jordan also had the similar experience. Um, so I started writing this book. I invited James and Jordan to collaborate on it as well. And I think with, and I would say with our powers combined, we managed to put together a pretty fantastic resource. So the first part of the book um, covers sort of all of the lichen basics, um, a lot of terminology, their life cycle, a bit about urbanization globally, um, and how they, and sort of some comparisons of our New York City lichens and um, lichens in other Northeastern urban centers to urban centers around the world. Uh, I, we also discussed like the intersection of fashion and lichens and a number of other really fun topics. There are also um, treatments over, with, of over 60 species, including technical descriptions, um, notes on the best places to find them, uh, how abundant they might be in urban areas specifically, and then any notes to help you, you know, any extra notes to help you really identify them and feel um, confident in your identification. There's a fully illustrated glossary that covers all of the terms that you'll need to identify lichens. Um, and then we've been, we attempted to include all of the 
pictures of all of the diagnostic features that you might need throughout the book. So for instance, um, we have the example of Xantoparmelia conspersa and flidii that differ only in their undersurface color, and we've included pictures of both of those. And we also included uh, a set of identification keys that uh, unlike most, so I think when most people are approached with a you know, dichotomous identification key, they think this is going to be a really hard and complex task that for lichens uh, and fungi involves you know, relatively minute, uh, potentially microscopic characters or something like that. And so I was really took the challenge of, of trying to produce a key that was actually usable to identify the lichens in the city, uh, in, in our northeastern cities, using only a hand lens. So minimal technical terms, which are all defined in the glossary with pictures, uh, and then just things that you would be able to tell with a hand lens and about their ecology. Uh, and so with this in mind, I this is something that classes that I've taught at the New York Botanical Garden have constantly asked for. And then finally, when I produced it, you know, I had a whole group of people spend several days looking at lichens under the microscopes first, just to sort of become familiar with the terms. And then they use, and the key, and then we use the key just walking around the grounds and using it to identify the species that we found as a group. And it worked really well. And I think that everyone kind of left inspired and, you know, a little enlightened more uh, at the end of the, of the class, because it was just sort of like, wow, not only has the world of these amazing organisms been opened up to them, you know, and they can see them and they are all around us, but they can also figure out what they are without a lot of really complex terms and, and technical tools. It's pretty simple. So uh, thank you all so much for tuning in today. I have to say it's really delightful to see so many names that I recognize and I haven't seen you all in quite a while. Um, and we would especially like to thank Jean Black, who is our editor at Yale University Press. She has been sort of an incredible champion of this book and the whole team at Yale um, just did a fabulous job. So, uh, and the publication of this book was supported by multiple organizations, including the Tory Botanical Society. So thank you again. Um, and then we have a long list of sort of collaborators and colleagues and organizations that support all of this urban lichen research. And so we thank all of these people and we also thank all of you for loving lichens because that's why you're here today as well as us. <laughs> and with that, I assume that Jordan uh, can moderate any questions that we would be happy to answer. Yes, thank you guys so much. That was a great talk. It was really interesting to hear um, just the really, really cool stories about lichens in the city and, and just sort of following the development of, of this lichen story from, from early, you know, a couple of centuries ago until now. Very, very interesting. Um, so I just want to remind everyone that, uh, you know, we are open for questions now. So please, if you have questions, uh, write them in the chat here, um, and then I'll read them off. Uh, so we already have one. We have, so first off, we already have some, some lovely comments in here too. Uh, you know, so uh, we have, thank you. Thank you so much for working on this book. I can hardly wait. That's amazing. Uh, one, one question says, have you guys looked into the difference between individuals of the same species occurring in urban versus natural areas? Great talk. Thank you. Um, so I guess I'll dive in and uh, just start out by saying that uh, certainly like just simply observing them, you know, we mentioned the city morphs and truly like the just even macroscopically they look very, they can look very different um, in the city versus more natural areas. Um, and they seem, we can tell that they're somewhat stressed out and especially you can tell um, you know, in, in addition to just like a scraggliness, um, sometimes you'll see that they'll even be, you know, overgrown by algae. So, you know, and they're perhaps not able to compete as well with co-occurring species in those areas. Um, we have not, well, we have not yet looked at the, maybe the genetic, genetic differences between urban and urban lichens and lichens from natural areas, unless you've had a chance to do that, James. 
uh, no, uh, Jason Bunchy South and I, uh, Jason at Fordham University, have a collaboration that we started looking at that, um, and we're actually putting a project together right now. So it's a timely, timely question. It's a really fascinating topic, and it's amazing that it hasn't really been looked at in detail. Um, uh, some more questions. Are there any invasive lichen species? Nope. There's no, but there's one that people often mention when this topic comes up, and that's Xanthoria parietina. Um, so its um, origin in North America seems to be a little bit shrouded in mystery. But when we look back at uh, historical natural history collections, it seems that it was likely here pre-colonization. Is that the is that true, James? Yeah. So no, we don't we don't contend with that particular issue. And that's why the lichens in places like New York have that's how we know that they've changed so much and we have such a stark pattern of the decline and then sort of recolonization. There's not this sort of um, additional noise, if you want to call it that, of species that uh, are invasive and that can come in and are highly adapted to those kinds of environments. Um, when lichens disappear, they disappear, and they're not replaced by other things. So it's, it's actually really fascinating because, you know, when people talk about invasive species, they often think about, you know, plants where you might lose a lot of native species uh, in an urban area, but you'll have an influx of a lot of invasive species or non-natives. Uh, and with lichens, that's just not the case. You know, you see trees that have far less cover and far less diversity, and that's just because we don't have, they don't seem to really tolerate the kind of movement um, that plants do. I have a small question to build off of this. Um, so it it seems like from your presentation and also from what I know about lichens that they're pretty that they're kind of poor invaders, right? Um, that when we bring them to new locations, they don't necessarily do well uh, in those locations. But I, I wanted to ask you guys, especially from a, a conservation perspective, do you think that we should be at all concerned about the, possi the possibility of lichens becoming introduced, becoming invasive in one, in one such instance. Uh, and to build off of that, should we be thinking about strategies to uh, eliminate introduced species before they become invasive, like we do with plants and insects? Yeah. So this is a great question, Jordan, and actually gives us an opportunity to build a little bit more on that story of Xanthoria parietina. So while it seems to, that species seems to be, um, you know, native to North America, it's kind of, it's, it has jumped around and its abundance has shifted dramatically. So there are regions, um, especially in the Pacific Northwest and in areas of Southern Ontario, where that species has become incredibly abundant where in the past it was not, uh, it does not seem to have been that abundant in the past. And it seems to be directly linked to nitrification. And nit nitrogen-based pollutants are still fairly um, widespread and they can, you know, they influence communities at very long distances. And so, you know, I would say, you know, I'm, I think nitrogen deposition is one of our sort of largest threats to some of our native communities of lichens that tend to be oligotrophic. So they don't, you know, they don't necessarily thrive in sort of high nutrient environments and they can't necessarily compete once that nitrogen deposition takes place. Um, so, you know, it, again, this is a little bit of a different story than when we're talking about sort of invasive pests or invasive plants. Um, but again, it's like, it's kind of this, theme in lichenology where we're really linking this back to shifts, major shifts in air quality that can happen on continental scales. And, it, and it, just to add to that, it doesn't seem like the, in the cases where lichens have been moved, because there's, you know, there are a small number of cases where lichens have become established uh, from trees that have been brought in or something, you know, from far away. Uh, they, there are a few historically known examples, and then there's this Xanthoria that's been watched more recently. It seems like by and large, even when they do persist after they've been moved and they can even continue to grow, they don't move out of those areas. So even though they might 
you know, exist on the tree that has been planted and maybe they, they are able to grow on a few or, or uh, disperse and establish on a few nearby trees. Uh, it seems like they don't actually move out of those areas. And it, there's, there's uh, Dennis Waters has done some really interesting work in New Jersey uh, where he's found certain species that clearly are not native and are brought in on nursery stock. And some of them are on nursery stock that appears to have been there for a really long time. Uh, you know, like at Princeton Nurseries, uh, and those species have not really moved out of those areas despite potentially having been there for a while. And we see that other places as well. In the grand scheme of like conservation issues, I think invasive lichens are not the like number one priority. <laughs> you know, things we should be, we're, well, there's a lot of other problems in this world <laughs> that I wouldn't worry about that one for Fair. sure first. Uh, let's keep going with some questions. Um, so, does the book cover lichens we'd likely find in nearby New Jersey and New York forests, or are only urban lichens covered? So it works, it works best in urban areas because we mainly, we wrote this book specifically, as Jesse highlighted, to really connect the city morphs because there are sort of some identification resources for other areas, but the pictures in those books don't look anything like the lichens in the cities, even though they're the same species in some cases. Um, but that being said, the book will work in adjacent areas of New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, um, you know, areas where there, there's, I would, I would say it's like sort of the urban suburban interface. Uh, so some more natural forests and parklands in your backyard in a lot of those places, the most common species are in the book. The identification keys should work uh, pretty well there. There's just, you have to take into account that the pictures might not necessarily be completely um, representative of what you would see there. It might look as, as, as one could say, a little bit nicer. <laughs> <laughs> different it's just different <laughs> um another question do you think lichens may return to the more modernized area uh, of the high line eventually or is the more curated area just not habitable for lichens at all so do you want i, I, I jesse do you want to say something? I have some thoughts on that. You're also, well, go ahead. You can dive in first. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to say that I think it's really, having gone into it with no preconception of what was going to be there, I was really surprised how many species are in that one little area. And having, you know, I live in downtown Manhattan. I walk along the High Line frequently. I go there with friends. Like I've, I've gone a lot and it's amazing that there really are not lichens there, including not on any of the trees that have brought in. I just assumed that there would be, you know, some common things that like that maple in front of an apartment building had been brought in on the nursery stock that was used to establish stuff there. And that really doesn't seem to be the case. So I'm not sure why that is. And then also, I think there's just, you look on the concrete, you look on the wood, and it seems like it's not just curated, but it's that there's such high levels of activity from people. There's so much visitation um, that they're just, they're not able to get established there. Uh, and if you like, I've noticed that in places like in downtown Manhattan near the Brooklyn Bridge, you can, if you look at a park bench where people sit all the time right under the bridge, there's no, no lichens on that park bench, even though it's really old. And except in the little shadow of the rails in between where people are supposed to sit. And that's because that's the one area where it's, you know, a little bit more stable habitat and people aren't rubbing them off constantly. So I think they can establish when they're allowed to, but again, it requires that kind of like unmanaged wild space. Maybe it's even just a few inches on a bench. Yeah. I absolutely agree with that. And I think disturbance is, you know, likely the major, um, factor that keeps lichens out of a space like the High Line. You know, again, it's like I searched that manicured area fairly well and was surprised to not even see the common species that are on cement. And I do, um, it did make me wonder if um, in addition to the heavy visitation, other disturbances like potentially pressure washing or um, sort of the sort of keeping that space clean might also um, prohibit lichens from really establishing. It's really weird though, that there are none on the trees. I yes, think. I agree. Um, Absolutely. So, and just, I guess, just to, you know, to sort of go directly to the comment, I think that the habitat, that the area is habitable for lichens because we know that there are lichens growing there. So it's not that it's not environmentally suitable. It's that there's a reason why they aren't there in those areas. And it's, it's gotta be a combination of disturbance um, and maybe just that they haven't 
been given the opportunity to establish there. Thank you. Uh, some more questions. Usnea, the genus Usnea sounds, uh, sounds like it's very sensitive to pollution or most sensitive to pollution. Uh, you mentioned smog and particulates, but there are particular, uh, but are there particular uh, chemical pollutants that are known to be problematic? Living here in Maine, Usnea is relatively abundant. What risks might they face? So yes, Usnea is, uh, are some of our, the most, some of the more um, sort of pollution sensitive species. And they are, you know, in addition to particulate matter, um, in general, sulfur-based pollutants like sulfur dioxide are uh, toxic to lichens and those nitrogen-based um, pollutants as well, so SOx and NOx. Um, there was a really interesting um, study that was published uh, based on data from Italy in the 1990s where they showed a really clear um, clear correlation between lung cancer rates and, or I guess we should say a negative correlation between lung cancer rates and lichen abundance and diversity. Um, and so I think one of the reasons that lichens are such a great sort of lens on, for us, you know, on our environments is because the, those pollutants, those chemical pollutants that they're really sensitive to are the same pollutants that really clearly impact human health negatively um, and actually cause disease in some cases. Um, did you, do you have anything on that question to add, James, before we tackle the second part of this? Okay, so in Maine, yeah, so you probably have a lot of lovely usneas. Gosh, they're so gorgeous. Um, and the question is, <laughs> what risks might they face? Um, gosh, in Maine, you know, in, in many rural areas, um, you know, we do have air pollutant drift and these sort of non-point sources of air pollution. Um, like, well, they've actually measured quite a bit of nitrogen deposition, for instance, in the high Arctic, when drifting all the way from, you know, down here, much closer to the equator. Um, that and, you know, in general, one of the major threats to many lichens is simply like habitat loss. So, you know, they don't tend to survive logging events, for instance, or, you know, the building of developments, things like this. I think that like maybe edge effects also from uh, like from those disturbances and from breaking up those habitats is also probably pretty influential yeah. as well. Fragmentation. Uh, yeah. Fragmentation. Um, are there any lichens that, that humans use for medicine or other uses? Uh, well, I'll take the other uses if you want to talk about medicine, James. <laughs> so Go for it. Go for lichens it, are a, a beautiful, a source of beautiful natural dyes. Of course, there are conservation considerations in collecting lichens for dyeing, um, but they're one of the only natural sources of the color purple, so um, absolutely gorgeous, and we do have a, some, a small section on that in the book, um, and especially looking at those purple dyes. It does, to make those purple dyes, does require uh, fermentation of the lichen material and ammonia, um, so for instance, like nowadays, I go buy ammonia, um, to ferment the lichens. And this only works in some species, but, you know, back in the day, you can think about where that ammonia may have come from and consider what it might have been like to dye um, lichens on a large scale that needed to be fermented in ammonia. Um, they also produce a number of other colors, a lov lovely yellows and browns, things like this. Um, and then medicinally, their medicinal uses, um, you know, do vary quite a bit. They produce over a thousand chemical compounds that no other organisms on the planet make. Um, and some of those have been shown, you know, to be very strong antibiotics, antifungals, um, anti you know, anti-carcinogens as well. So they have activity against cancerous cells. So, you know, the potential for lichens as a source of medicine is there. And indeed in some places they are, um, they are used still today as medicine. So if you were to go into a pharmacy in Switzerland, for instance, you could buy a tincture of the lungwort lichen, Loveria pulmonaria, 
And indeed, you do see a lot of Esnia tinctures around uh, these days if you're like looking, if you're really into herbal supplements. And this is, um, I'm glad you asked this because this is one of our public service announcements, actually two. Um, one is that the harvesting of lichens is not really closely regulated. So, um, and it can really be damaging native populations. So if you're out there like buying Esnia tinctures, be a bit careful with that. Um, and then in high quantities, a lot of these lichen substances that are extracted are liver toxins. Um, and so don't, if you're, you know, if you're using an Esnia tincture, be a bit careful uh, because they can be acutely toxic. I think it's also worth adding that, uh, you know, the the just in general the harvesting you know we've talked a lot about how lichens can't really be sort of moved around and cultivated so to speak uh very readily and so it's really important to realize that anytime you see lichens for sale or used in any way um it means that they're being taken from a natural population uh and and there's a really strong possible and there that's very there's very little regulation of that and there's very little monitoring of what the impact that that has on the ecosystems where they were taken from uh and so anytime you see lichens for instance dyed in a planter at like whole foods available for sale or in a window display or anywhere you know you can buy them by the pound on etsy uh it's really you should question what's going into that and whether or not it's really sustainable. In reality, it probably is not. Yep. And unlike mushroom forming fungi, you know, with a lichen, what you see is what you get. So, you know, when you go out and you forage a mushroom, you know, most of that fungus is still in whatever it was growing on. And you're really just, you know, harvesting the tip of that iceberg. But with lichens, it's not like that at all. So if you take an individual of a lichen from a place, it's, it's that individual is gone. So forever. Yeah. So be careful, be careful. I have one last question for you guys, and then we'll talk just briefly about, about the book. Um, and then, and then that'll be it. Uh, so, uh, the lichen, is the lichen taxonomy in as much flux as more mainstream botany? How well-defined are lichen species? James, I think this one clearly uh, falls <laughs> most in your wheelhouse, the great describer of lichen species. <laughs> I would say that lichen taxonomy is not in nearly the same kind of flux as other areas. Um, you know, by and large, we understand the higher level taxonomy of things pretty well. I think there's always some unexpected surprises when, you know, just species that haven't been sequenced before get sequenced and then put into the phylogenetic framework, the evolutionary history of lichens for the first time. Uh, also, because lichens are fungi and it's a lifestyle that's evolved many times in fungi, uh, there's sort of unexpected surprises where we find out that they're related to some fungus we didn't think they were related to, or they are they belong to a group of fungi that we just didn't think they did. Um, but that being said, by and large, you know, the taxonomy is actually relatively stable. There are many new species that are found all the time, but those are by and large not the most common species that you'll see. So in an area like Eastern North America, you know, if you walk into a forest or if you go into your backyard, all of the species that you see by and large have a really well-defined name that is, you know, as stable as red maple or tulip poplar or something like that. Um, there are certainly issues with how well-defined lichen species are, but that mainly comes from the fact that historically people didn't have access to the like microscopy and other sort of really detailed analytical tools that we have today. So they called lichens that looked really somewhat similar in very different places the same thing. So like the same species, same thing was called, or so lichens that look similar were called the same thing in Japan, Australia, the United States, and Southern Chile. And then lo and behold, when we come back and we looked at them with, um, you know, tools that are available to us now, besides DNA sequencing, just more careful morphology, chemistry, ecology, we see that they're not the same. And so most of the time, I think that, you know, that's like not, a, wouldn't be a surprise to many people in retrospect. Um, and so there are certainly things changing and there is always the chance that, you know, something will be defined a little differently, but it doesn't usually impact how we interpret a species within a given region, like the Northeast or Eastern North America.
Does that answer that question? I tried to be as eloquent and short as possible. <laughs> I, I think so. That was great. Yeah. Thank you, both of you. Uh, I really appreciate you uh, making the time to come and talk to the Tory crowd. Uh, this was fantastic. It sounds like everyone really enjoyed it. Uh, there's, I encourage you to check out the chat because there's a lot of really positive comments in here. It's fantastic. Um, do you guys want to talk briefly about, about where to get the book or, or when it, to expect it? I can yeah. also provide a link in the chat here. Oh, that would be awesome. I yeah, please, Jordan. Yeah, so it is available for pre-order already. And, uh, you know, given um, all of the sort of supply chain issues, we're, we're looking at probably a release date of November 21st. So, and, you know, unless you have your advanced author's copy, which is so delightful to see. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so Yale, you'll also find it at most major book you know, most major bookstores, um, you can have your own local bookstore, put an order in for it. Um, and yeah, so perfect timing for Christmas presents, I would say. You can always, uh, like the holidays, New Year's, yeah. you can always, you know, if someone can identify the shipping container that the books are in and swim out in the port to go find them, please let us know. Uh, but but uh, it's just, it's unfortunate, but we're being impacted by the same supply chain issues that, that everyone is. So yep. you know, they're on their way. We, we can promise they exist. We've seen them. Yeah. <laughs> it is real. Thus ends the support your local lichenologist PSA. And your local bookstore. And your local yes. bookstore, and yeah. And your local bookstore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming out, for, for giving this talk. It was fantastic. I had a great time. Hope everyone else did. Um, uh, so everyone, uh, please stay tuned for future announcements. We're going to have another talk uh, given in November. Uh, okay, just like usual. We'll have one December as well. And I'm looking forward to, uh, to bringing that to you guys. So thank you all. I hope you have a great night. Take care, everybody. See y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming.